Okay, hi everyone. Sorry for being late. I have some problems with the laptop to turn on the presentation, so I finally we, we are to find it. Um, I will start. I will do a bit faster presentation because I have less time. So yeah, at the end there will be a lot of questions if you don't understand. Um, I, I want to start to present me. I am Matias Vara. Um, I study electronic engineer in the University of La Plata in Argentina. And then my PhD I did in, in France, and I work with in Citrus and in Cambridge, and then in Silicon, which is my, my, my work now. And during my free time, I developed Toro Kernel. I will present you a bit of that uh, in the follow. Actually, what is Toro? It is a kernel based on x86, 64 architecture. The whole kernel is well, it is written in Free Pascal. Um, uh, the idea is to provide a simple API to the user applications to compile all all together. So in this sense, it's application oriented. So it is a really simple set of APIs. And as I said before, uh, the application and the kernel are compiled um, together, and then they are running the, the zero ring of the of the processor. It means that they are not different level of privilege. So they are all together there, and they are compiled together. Um, generating an, an, an image, and this image can run in several hypervisors like Hyper-V, KVM, well, emulator, Akim, or virtual box. Um, what I say is more or less is this. You have your application, and then you write your application using the API that Toro provides. Um, the compiler, which is the FreePascal compiler, will just bring all together and generate the, an image. This image then you can use, it's a .emg, so you can use this in, a, in an hypervisor, while well, you can transform the Translate, transform the, the format of the image and then use in VMware or KVN and so on. What is nice here is that you can use the same image in all hypervisors. You, know, you don't have to, to modify depending on the hypervisor that you want to run. Um, that is more or less the total stack. Well, you have the, the hardware, which is always the same, which is in the, this architecture effects. That, well, maybe, maybe you have or not the layer of the hypervisor. You have the whole the whole kernel that we propose the um, the model that most of the operating normal operating systems have, more operating systems have, like the scheduler, memory, device driver, network, and so on. Uh, currently, we I just finished the driver for BitIO, for example, but also we have for emulated device like E1000 and so on. Mm. Which in the virtual file system, for the moment we are supporting X2 which is easy to use. And well, on top of that, you have the user application. As I said before, uh, kernel and application are in the same level. They are not different uh, in the execution, in the sense that they are using the same ring of privilege. Um, <coughs> so the idea of this talk was, I don't know what is this. Mm. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I don't see the mouse here. I can continue a bit saying what I'm going to talk is actually when in this presentation I, I wanted to talk about the kernel itself. I did that two, two years ago, in 2015, saying more or less what was special on it. And in this case, it was most, in, most interesting to show some work that I did in the last three, four weeks when I tried to reuse the CPU usage 
of the photo running as a VM, like a chemo VM or KVM VM. Um, and actually, that is to talk about. I mean, it's how I, I figured out that it was consuming a lot of CPU because the guess was at 100% of, of the CPU slash. And how the presentation is about how I tried to do some API to try to reduce the consumption of a VM guess. More or less, it's that the presentation, and I'm going to, to show that in very soon, I hope. <laughs> um, <coughs> that's it. Um, so actually, what's, what what was observing when I was running Toro as a key move guess was if I do it in top on the host, we seeing that the VM was consuming 100 percent of the CPU, which is completely unacceptable in terms of production. That you cannot have a VM that is consuming 100 percent of CPU. Um, almost there. Um, Okay, I can do it with those slides. I, 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 I cannot show any picture, but I can see, show the picture at the end if you want. But I can explain what I did anyway. So you, you, you don't need this? No. Okay, well, <laughs> I don't have to use it. Okay. It's okay. okay. Um, well, actually, the problem was that, well, as I said before, when I was running Toro as a guest, I was observing that 100% of the CPU was consuming, and actually I didn't know why what that was happening. And, and then I, when I started to analyze, to figure out the, where the, code, the kernel was running, I figured out that there were many idle loops in the code in different parts of the code, and that was consuming a lot of CPU. So actually the first thing that I did was to identify this point, and actually I found three points in the kernel that were using idle loops, uh, which is a common, com in, some, in, some, in some areas it's very used, the, the use of an either loop that keep in the loop, uh, checking a condition and doing some work if its condition is true or it's not, it's keep looping. Um, so actually I identified three, three parts in the code where using the either loop was in the use of spin logs in the scheduler and there were some threads in the system that they were uh, doing implementing either loops. They were doing some work, carrying the scheduler, and doing always the same. So actually, what they start to do is start to look for bibliography to figure out how this fixes it. And actually, in the case of spin logs, uh, Intel proposed to use the, maybe you know, the post instruction inside the spin log. It's in a way to relax the CPU, to tell the, the, the CPU, hey, I am in a loop. Well, I don't remember exactly how the instruction behave. I have that in the slide. <laughs> um, but the thing is, delay the next instruction in order to relax the CPU. An idea of the whole idea is to try to relax the CPU in all that cases. So in the case of the scheduler, I was figuring out that the, when, the, when there is no thread or, any, or no thread was ready in the system, the scheduler was just keeping the in a loop. So in this case, it was quite easy to fix. I, what, I, what I tried to do was to, to use the hold instruction. So in that case, when the, the scheduler queue was empty, I was just halting the core. So the core was completely da dead. And, it's all, and then wake up, it has an interruption at the end. For instance, you receive a packet, more or less. Um, and the third case was a, the harder case, because I have some thread that could be system thread or user thread that were using either loop. So it was harder because I had to find a way to tell to the to tell the scheduler that I am doing needle work. So what I tried to do was I implement an API based on two two two, two functions. One to say um, to say the scheduler I am doing needle work, and in that case the scheduler will just count the time that a thread is in idle state. Um, the idea is that you have many, many threads in the system. The scheduler will go asleep only if all the threads in the system are doing needle loop. In that point, the scheduler will say, OK, I will hold the core, the, the system. Um, that was the, the tricky part, because you cannot hold the core if you have some thread in ready state, for sure, right? So the idea was to 
to, well, I don't remember exactly all, all the API, but the, the idea was to tell the scheduler, hey, I'm doing needle work, it comes sometimes, and after that time, you say, okay, if I have all the threads in needle state, I will stop the, completely the call. And the second API was a, was, a, was a function to tell the scheduler, okay, I'm doing some work, so stop to count me that I'm idle somehow. So in that case, the, the state of that thread will become ready again. It's quite hard to explain like this because I have, I'm using a lot of you know, terminology that maybe it sounds weird. Um, uh, I feel sorry I could not show the presentation. Um, and actually when I implement this to a style, I try to compare what happened actually. And if I compare Toro, the old Toro with the new Toro, you can see that we are now uh, ha uh, saving the half of the power CPU because now when there is not any packet, for instance, the CPU goes to zero CPU slash. I mean, if you run top on this host, you see that. So now I, you are consuming the half that we were consuming before. For instance, if you send packets, you, you tell me if I am out of time, okay? Um, if you send during 60 second packet and then you stop during 60 second, like this, right? You observe that it's 100% during the first 60 seconds and then zero to in the next 60 seconds. Um, that was a first quite nice result. was easy to implement also. It took me five days to implement all of that. But then I started to compare with something more serious like Apache, for instance, running as a guest. And it was quite interesting because what I observed that was that Will Torres stays at at 100% during the first 60 seconds of my experience, Apache stay at 40%. And in the, in the case that this, in the case that Apache was idle, goes to the one, goes to the 10% of the CPU, right? And it was quite interesting because I say, okay, I thought it was, my result was good, but that one is much more better than mine. Um, the interesting thing was when you start to increment the request in the in, the, in this. 60 seconds windows. So you see that in the case of Apache, of Apache the CPU start to scale. So at that point of 200 requests during the first 60 seconds, you see that the CPU goes to more or less the same than Toro. I mean, to 100% of the CPU. Um, so the takeaway lessons were that, okay, you cannot have if you, if you have production, you cannot have a VM that is running at 100%. Uh, and it's depending on what application you are running in the guest, you, can, and you cannot control more or less that. Um, the solution that you can implement, in, in my case, it was quite basic because this, is, this instruction that I use, that is called instruction, is well supported for more of the hypervisors. But if you want to do something more complex and use another instructions, that depends on the hypervisor, if it is supported or not. I mean, if it's, it's, the hypervisor will emulate or not that instruction. I'm talking about maybe you know the M wide and M control instruction, which is not quite quite well supported, but it's something more intelligent than the HALT would say, okay? And the, the third takeaway, le takeaway lesson, I would say that my solution that was only HALT the core was not enough, for sure, and a real solution had to take into account the scaling of the CPU, which is much more complex to implement for sure. That's only how the instruction, right? Um, yeah, that was a, more or less a talk, actually. Um, it w it's, it's, I mean, it was really an, an experimentation, right? I mean, uh, that's it. I don't know if someone had a question because I, I speak so fast and <laughs> Well in the case of the in the case of the networking particularly it's not it's not blocked. So, for instance, if you, well, that is how I implement it. If you want to get a packet, you will ask the upper layer the packet, but the, that function will return nil, I mean, null, if, it's not, if there is no packet. This will not block until someone arrives. So, so in the case of the networking, it is not blocking at all. In, in, 
in the whole stack. I mean, and I think for that I should I had to implement such a API to try to to turn off the. I mean, if we, if if in the case we will blo block it, I would not I would not need such API because you will block and at all, right? But yeah, I know. <laughs> I already thought about that. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, I, the whole stack the API, the whole network stack is not blocked. Mm. Sorry, can you repeat the question? I didn't hear it. Currently, you use like something like an interrupt from the network stack. So you get like an event as a callback that says, hey, there is now network data available. Can you start reading network data now instead of using a busy loop in your program? Yeah, maybe. I can do that. Yeah. yeah. So then you I do all the work well, instead of packing the CPU all the time asking if, if there is like network data available. Yeah. Well, I think I could do something like that. I now I don't have in mind all the decision and assumption that I did when I was working in the socket. So maybe if I do that now. Now it will not work. What I thought, but I can think about that. I, I every, everything I have a reason, but I don't remember all the reasons. So <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you have someone or another question. I will show. I will show some. I will show something. Um, some demo at four. I will show maybe the f three slides that I show or the workflow that I, do, I do, and I will run on the cloud. Uh, Toyo guest. I will run a web browser on Toyo, so you can access and you trust me that it works. Um, so is it if it is possible, I will do it at four. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, sorry for the.